Uh, let's like take a look at what the front pages of tomorrow morning's papers are saying, and I'll get my. There's no surprises what they're what they're focusing on. Uh, let's do that with uh, Connor Tomlinson, who joins me now. Connor, good to have you with us tonight. Evening, Claudia. Uh, yeah. It's um, Sajid Javid uh, dominating uh, the papers. Oh, big shock. Yeah, I mean, I I personally did not like how he seemed to be putting the blame on us, or at least saying, if you don't do, if you don't introduce, if you like, your own self-imposed restrictions, uh, it's going to be your fault. I have to do it uh, later on uh, this year. But we'll, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later, Connor. Uh, let's start with the eye. Uh, they're saying get booster jab and wear mask to save Christmas, uh, which is what Sajid Javid is urging, they're saying. Yeah, I, I'm quite surprised that the, the newspaper seems to be so running so neutrally with this because we have a, what would this be, the fourth lockdown now? And mm. I, I think we're sort of getting the vibe that maybe this tactic might not be working so well. As a lot of people have come on talk radio and said before, as one of your earlier callers said, the lockdown policies don't seem to have done much. Um, even though you said earlier, oh, did it not reduce transmission between the first lockdown and the Thanks second lockdown? Yeah, exactly well, that's all right. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure. You make my evenings much more <laughs> enjoyable, uh, much more tolerable than the headlines, I can tell you. Uh, the funny thing is, it, it obviously, as we've seen with the delayed onset with flu, with the super cold that's now going around, and also the spike in, in infections then when the winter went back around, what it did was delay immunity for the rest of the population that could have had herd immunity with COVID, rather than going with the shielding approach for the vulnerable and the elderly that was declared in the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, so it seemed to just onset the inevitable and instead create concentrated transmission vectors in supermarkets and hospitals where key workers and the vulnerable had to go. So I don't think lockdowns really? were ever attended Connor, also. Connor, there are some people who speculate that if not for mm. lockdowns, the, the many we have had, if, if not for them, there could have been easily half a million people dying uh, well, the, the modelling was always off. And then if you look at the case of a place like Sweden, where they didn't lock down, mm. um, their cases have been consistently lower than ours. Their deaths have been consistently lower. But then if lower. you look at Australia, deaths are just a yeah. fraction of compared to what we've had. And they've, had, well, of course, had very severe lockdowns, crazy severe. Yeah, it, well, exactly. And then they're also building COVID quarantine camps into 2022. Um, and they're also incredibly frustrated about their low vaccine uptake, even though, well, as we've seen with the jabs now, and, and said, yeah, turning around and saying, it. if you look at the government's recent coronavirus report, they, if you do the breakdowns of the deaths, 78% uh, of people that died were double jabbed. Now, that's, I don't want to be misconstrued here. That's not to say the jab isn't working. It is this, clearly is. It's the actually, recent deaths, obviously, the recent deaths we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, this was the week 41. And was that 7 0, you said? 70% of 78. people? 78. 78. Oof. Yeah, and that, this, that's this, not to say this, the jab isn't working. Yeah, but that's not to say the jab isn't working. The jab is obviously working so well mm. that it's only the very concentrated people who the jab isn't going to work on that well because mm. they're so elderly or mm. so ill that it, 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 it it's not going to save. But clearly, then it's not a predicate for saying a zero COVID policy like it would have been in Australia and like vaccine passports, that's their idea because it's not 100% certain. So we can't eliminate COVID. Well, uh, the Times, uh, their headline focusing again on Sajid Javid, uh, his warning that daily COVID cases could hit 100,000. So, and Connor, as we, we've seen things opening up uh, since July the 19th, Freedom Day, so-called, uh, and we are seeing cases rising. And there's a really good chance, indeed, as uh, Sajid Javid is warning here, that we could hit 100,000 cases. If that happens, you can say hello to Plan B. Do, do, you, do you think that could happen? And if it does happen, you don't think plan we should go to Plan B? Well, I think Plan B is very likely. I, I think they sort of kicked the can down the road, so yeah. to speak. Uh, back when we talked ages ago about vaccine passports, we were practically celebrating them, uh, saying, oh, they've been scrapped because they were hypocritical, that you couldn't have brought them in, the enforcement cost was ridiculous, it was immoral, etc. And then suddenly they were re-emerged again as, oh, well, it's always an inevitability. It, it seems to it seems to have been on the cards all the time and they were just trying to find a way to make it more palatable and sell it to us the funny thing is though again with that the cases are increasing all that means is if the cases are increasing but hospitalizations are pretty mild and the deaths aren't skyrocketing it means that a lot of younger people like me uh, are getting covid and then actually getting the benefits of natural immunity that they were weren't allowed to get under lockdown um and therefore they're actually not going to get the the worst strains and, and they're not going to get strains which circumvent the vaccines as, as have been happening so fortunately it doesn't like we've broken the link between hospitalization and deaths and so again cases aren't really a predicate for imposing any restrictions mm, at the mirror again uh focusing on this uh this time focusing on uh saying the fight is not over which isn't what they said in july that would have been helpful <laughs> if maybe when they opened things up they could have said no it's not over and let's keep some restrictions uh but with this fight connor you you don't think any restrictions should be introduced at all? 
well, I don't think they're morally tenable, and also I don't think any of the plans that they've produced uh, have worked particularly. I think one of the useful things could be, for example, if we have a really awful strain of COVID again, rather than unilaterally locking everyone down who isn't particularly vulnerable, if you have the shielding approach where people who uh, need time off work because they've got a pre-existing health condition, you can write off their extended sick, sick pay on the tax returns at the end of the business year. That would mean that we wouldn't have to do furlough, we wouldn't have to do lockdowns, but businesses wouldn't have to go under to support their sick employees. But the rest of us shouldn't have to shield for something we're not actually vulnerable to. So what about uh, the the argument in terms of protecting the NHS and the pressures that they will see if indeed uh, COVID cases do rise to that 100,000 100, a day? Uh, they, they're saying that with that you could see a thousand people a day going having to go to hospital, which means people with other issues, other health problems could be pushed aside. They won't get the help and support they need because of that. When the NHS became the national COVID service during lockdown, we've now got a massive backlog. So I don't see how recreating a lockdown, which would then create a backlog. Again, we're going to have this perpetual cycle of people not being able to seek treatment and then dying en masse from all the other things that weren't COVID, particularly much younger than the average COVID death age. And we didn't use Nightingale facilities at all when they were set up. Um, they were drastically understaffed. And uh, also the NHS every winter is at max capacity because we've got, uh, with our health care system, due to dense population and also a, a rate of funding that doesn't keep pace with the net increase of people that come in every year and don't pay into the system. We've got over-occupied beds every winter. It's always above 90%. So it's not something that's that's uh, to be unsurprised. Uh, it's not something that can't be planned for. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just usually the, the COVID beds are chocked up, but also the rest of the hospital that isn't COVID related is no, completely empty. You're so right, Connor. Every winter we have issues uh, with uh, and the NHS hospitals facing uh, facing real real pressures. However, add COVID to it, as as we saw last winter, that increased that sent uh, that pressure to a whole new level. And that's the worry here. You know, you are saying, okay, we we lock things down, and then there was a huge backlog. But then, if you if the backlog we're dealing with now, when cases are not as high as they were, if you deal with that backlog now with cases rising, surely. Surely you won't get that people will not get the support and treatment they need in that. Well, you're not going to deal with the, the backlog of the you know, X amount of million cancer patients, especially because they have much longer extended treatment than the lockdown can last for, unless the lockdown is going to last for you know another six months to a year, which is a terrifying prospect. And again, as soon as you impose a lockdown, all those people might be able to get seen on special missions, but then you've got a lot of people that aren't going to be seen, uh, especially because they're getting misdiagnosed on digital D GP services, or they don't want to go into the hospital because they're fearing catching COVID in the hospital, because again, there's a concentration tra uh, transmission vector. So you're going to create a lot of left behind cases and create another backlog for conditions that aren't on COVID if you reimpose another lockdown we're going to be trapped in a vicious cycle. Mm. Uh, let's turn to the Daily Express uh, this time again focus on COVID but uh, uh, looking at a different angle really uh, new drugs to fight off COVID as uh, Sajid Javid warned we we can't blow it now as we uh, as he unveiled a uh, two game-changing antiviral drugs to to bolster the winter COVID battle so this is something yeah not many uh, not many papers have, have really they kind of not, not missed it, but they didn't really focus on that. We could have something which could better treat people uh, who are dealing with dealing with COVID. It's one of the great things, actually, I, I will say to, to praise the UK's approach to it. We focused pretty predominantly on the vaccine, um, which doesn't come at not a cost, but also we are focusing on developing therapeutics around the world. Now, as he said, we bought them from Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, it's quite funny how a lot of the media has gone on about ivermectin being a horse to wormer, and then Pfizer are actually trialing it as using it as a therapeutic, so there may be something to that. Um, but if we can learn to live with COVID and actually administer therapeutics rather than rely, uh, as you said before, on the constant booster shots and updating your vaccine passport, like you're getting stamps from every country you've been to, that's a much more tenable approach to not only allowing people to live with COVID, even though I kind of reject that phrase, but also the people who are struggling with COVID and the vaccines hasn't worked for them because they're so vulnerable or elderly, then having a sort of form of treatment may actually be a, a genuinely life-saving alternative for them. All right, uh, Connor, we will continue this, take a look at uh, some other papers. I also want to get your views on what will winter, particularly Christmas, be like for you if indeed these restrictions are, if we do go into Plan B, they are introduced if those numbers, uh, those new COVID cases numbers uh, continue to rise. Uh, but for now, uh, Connor, stick with us. We'll get more from you um, after the break. You are listening to Claudia Eliza Vanderpoint on Talk Radio. Online, on DAB and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Claudia Eliza on Talk Radio. 
Uh, you are listening to Claudia Liza on uh, Talk Radio or watching me on Talk Radio TV. Uh, joining me tonight, uh, looking through tomorrow morning's papers, is Connor Tomlinson. Uh, as we were saying uh, before the break, Connor, uh, COVID and, and the press briefing from Sajid Javid uh, tonight is really dominating the papers on The Independent. Their headline, Act Now or Face COVID Restrictions, uh, the warning from Sajid Javid, uh, saying the Health Secretary has warned that coronavirus restrictions could return in England in the run-up to Christmas as UK infections hit almost 50,000 in a single day. I was asking you, how would you feel about uh, restrictions introduced ahead of Christmas? Well, I'd, I'd also like to know really what Sajid Javid thinks that the average Brit can do. He seems to think mask wearing is going to work. Well, with the sister state studies of the Dakotas and Sweden compared to us, etc., states and mask mandates didn't really do an awful lot, and the mask slipped, if you forgive the pun. When Neil Ferguson came out and said the other day, oh, we should reimpose mask mandates, but not because they worked in stopping transmission, particularly because the anything other than M95, the microfibers are way too big to actually stop a COVID particulate going through on, on general usage, um, but because me and the rest of the behavioural scientists on stage think it's actually going to trick people into thinking, oh, behavioural compliance, mm. if I see masks around, you'll remember the pandemic still going on it's, it's the same sort of arbitrariness of the uh, six feet away social distancing rule it's not actually based on the science which is an arbitrary number conjured up mm. um, also the idea that the booster jab is going to help everyone well as we've seen in places like israel um, as we've seen in a not peer-reviewed study yet um, that's, that's looking at the effects of the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Pfizer and Johnson Johnson, after months, keep waning their effectiveness because of the uh, mutagenic nature of the virus, because you get animal reservoirs, because it can circumvent the actual vaccine itself, and it can drop to between 24 or 3% effectiveness uh, at the worst possible rates. So that's pretty staggering. Yeah. So if they think we're just going to keep getting the jab, Connie, that's not really a tenable policy. Connie, you say you say this, in, in let's, let's talk about the mask. Let's go back to the mask. Mm. Um, you say this, when, when it came to... Asian countries, uh, Japan, mm. Hong Kong, China, when dealing with SARS, MERS, and now coronavirus, they they adopted a mask wearing policy, which continued even after uh, the issue of SARS and MERS disappeared. I went to Hong Kong, I want to say 2011, uh, and you, you went there and it was just a mask wearing nation. Are you saying then that the mask was ineffective there was there was they had there was no reason for them to wear that to use them and wear them well, I need to see the data then, but it seems mm. to become more of a cultural phenomenon, especially because uh, a lot of Asian nations are more shame than, than uh, guilt-based cultures. So they're quite, uh, they're not as high a trust as we are. They're more um, uh, sort of social responsibility focused. That's why you see like a very high corporate culture in Japan, for example. Um, but over here, the cloth masks and the sort of blue plastic ones, which, as you said earlier, you're buying all those from China, by the way. So you're rewarding the exact country <laughs> that released the virus on us economically. Uh, those don't seem like the smartest plan to actually stop COVID because they haven't seemed to have done very much. And if you if you look at the uh, microfiber makeup, the, the fibers are far too big to stop COVID particulates going through. All right. Uh, let us I'll, I'll stay quickly. Uh, just a couple more stories uh, with the uh, with uh, Sajid Javid's announcement for us to uh, to do our part. This is what we need to do to prevent any further uh, restrictions being introduced. Uh, a Financial Times saying act now or expect return to COVID curbs this winter. Uh, their main headline saying Sajid Javid warned that England is facing its last chance to avoid a return of restrictions. What did you make of of Sajid Javid telling us, uh, the nation or the people of England, to to change how how we live to sort to more or less introduce a, a self imposed self imposed restrictions in our lives is is was that the right thing to do? Because from from my point of view, it looked like he was essentially blaming us for doing the very was, thing they allowed us to do. It was a bit do. of blackmail, really, wasn't it? I felt like a kid in a high chair mm. being, uh, having a spoon prodded in his face. And <laughs> if you don't eat your broccoli, you're not getting the pudding in the fridge. Um, I, again, I, all of his suggestions seem to be more social conformity-based rather than evidence-based. Uh, backing it up is the... Well, I love how they said, as as you said before the break, um, back in June when they said they were taking away all the restrictions, it was irreversible but cautious. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's irreversible to then reimpose restrictions on us when you're the same exact people who are preaching just how irreversible it was. Um, I, I don't think you get to claim a victory on that particular tactic. And I don't think it's fair, just like how everyone says, oh, every politician lies. I don't think it's fair for us to just sort of accept lockdown restrictions as we do politicians lying, as if we've got some sort of Stockholm syndrome just because we're so used to it, just because we're used to it. And 
we didn't we've been beaten into accepting it it doesn't make it any more right yeah also uh, something else added uh, just just sprung on us if, if you like and this is the uh, the main focus on the on the metro's front page a uh, call to arms oh, lovely i love that call but two is two uh, two uh, millions of people who made britain's vaccines roll out a success have now been urged to roll up their sleeves for two more shots a covid booster in one arm and a flu jab in the other so yeah one of the one of the ways uh, the health secretary said we can avoid going into plan b is if we go out and get the booster jab however that was kind of news to many people and unless you were maybe vulnerable or of a certain age nobody had any idea that this is something we should all be doing yeah, it's the exact same thing with when they turned around and the JCBI said, oh, we don't think it has a, much of a benefit of vaccinating children. They turned around and said, well, actually, we're, we're going to consider other children. factors. <laughs> yeah, and it, isn't it funny how the other factors always seem to make all of their friends that run these sort of companies a lot of money by expanding the customer base and the guaranteed amount of people that really need all this stuff. And then, obviously, all of our taxes are paying. Uh, I know you were chatting to Amy before when they said, oh, there isn't much information about the booster vaccines out there. Actually, if you're cheap like me and don't pay for Spotify Premium, you get these adverts all the time between your songs. And who's paying? for that the taxpayer so we're constantly being berated by to get something we've already paid for that we're being told is free by adverts that we're currently paying for and it's going to go till the end of time if we keep having to update these boosters so it just seems like one big uh, scam really okay uh let's finish on the sun which has a very different headline actually it looks like <laughs> the only paper and now I tell a lie in the Daily Star. The Sun and the Daily Star not focusing on, on Sadi Javid's uh, announcement uh, last uh, tonight. Uh, Keep Calm Mum is its headline after the Queen sparked health fears by cancelling her first royal duties in 15 years. Yes, the first time she's, she's done that in 15 years. Lots of worries about her health. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, like me, we're, we're sort of got a Republican leanings, but everyone just goes, oh, we like the Queen, though, because even if you have a slight concern over the political power, the monarchy may be able to, to have when they intervene in political affairs, because um, ultimately the buck stops with her. The Queen has showed remarkable restraint, excellent leadership since her wartime appointment. Um, so I think it would be a, a great loss to the country when inevitably the Queen either has to step down for health reasons or unfortunately pass away and, and joins Prince Philip. And I think everyone's holding their breath not only because we want the Queen to be better, but the last thing we want, because he keeps going on about all this uh, big spending <laughs> eco-nonsense and how he's going to get involved with world politics, is Charles in charge. It's a pretty dreadful prospect. Well, well Connor, you know, it looks like the Queen does care about climate change as well. She seemed a little bit miffed that uh, leaders are, are talking and not taking action. But Connor Tomlinson, always a pleasure talking to you. Have yourself a good night. Thanks pleasure. so much for joining us tonight on Talk Radio.